Hey everybody, this episode of Dr. Drew After Dark is brought to you by Stamps.com, Proactive, and Hymns for Hymns. But I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. But please, I want you to go to Merch Method, M-E-R-C-H Method, dot com slash Tom Segura, you know who he is, and get your new Dr. Drew After Dark t-shirt. They are new in the store, they're now in the store, and uh, the new logos on there, they are pretty cool. We appreciate your support of the show, so it's... Uh, I'd you know, love to see you guys out there wearing that shirt. We appreciate it very much. Now let's get into the show. Hi, I'm Dr. Drew, and this is Dr. Drew After Dark. Please be advised that Dr. Drew After Dark may contain sexually oriented content and be unsuitable for young children. Well, I told you I'm going to tell you a little more about this uh, live event at Caroline's on Broadway in New York City. Of course, we're coming to New York live, Dr. Drew After Dark. It is August 29th at Caroline's on Broadway. Two great comedians joining me for the live show, the great Rich Voss and the lovely Kat Timpf. Tickets are only available in advance, so you got you to gotta get to them now. They're going to sell out quickly. You go to Caroline's at Broadway, excuse me, Caroline's on Broadway, their website. So come prepared with your best questions. Uh, if you want to ask me about brown or yellow or white or whatever it is, please bring the, all these questions. I look forward to hanging out with my Dr. Drew After Dark family in person on August 29th at Caroline's on Broadway. But um, until then, nothing bigger than this. Don't prolapse your anus. Welcome, everybody, to another Dr. Drew After Dark. We appreciate the emails at drdrewafterdark at gmail.com and, of course, the voice messages at 818-253-1693. And uh, don't forget to check out my website and check out the family of pods that we have there as well. And be sure to support the people that support these podcasts and this YouTube channel because uh, without them, it's pretty hard to keep this all going and keep this operation. All the guys you hear laughing behind the scenes wouldn't have a job. We're not for the people that support us here, so... Please, please, please. Uh, when I, and by the way, I'm, I'm into all, all the stuff that I, I say I'm into. I'm not just bullshitting you guys. Uh, <laughs> welcome now, my guest, Jessa Reed. Jessa, welcome to the program. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Oh, we appreciate you being here. Your website? Uh, JessaReed.com. Shocking. Yeah. Uh, and can people see you somewhere coming up? Stand up? Um, no. Not anywhere coming up? I'm semi-retired for a minute. I'm trying to really? stay home and make more content. And as soon as I... Cleared the calendar to do that. They started earthquake retrofitting. Your house? My apartments, yeah. So it's, I mostly just stayed home to listen to construction. Oh, that's nice. Great. That's a nice, a nice touch. And do you have kids? I have four kids total. Oh. I have a 24 year old who I had when I was a teenager. Well, I see the picture of you with a little girl in, in your website. I feel like that's. Yeah. So the two youngest are. Yeah nine and five right they're in the website i saw them there yeah and, and your 24 year old what 24 year old she has a one-year-old do you have all girls all girls and then i have wow. a 16 year old stepson from a recently ah. ended marriage ah and so your daughter's 24 doing okay very good good very good you know one of the things about the children of teen parents you were, were you a teenager mm -hmm. they end up better statistically than you would expect really yeah. They statistically end up as teenage parents also. They're a higher probability that. I'm a huge teen mom fan. Oh, are yeah. you? So any yeah. questions about the ladies? <laughs> yeah. I was um, at home with postpartum depression during the first few seasons when I had my two youngest kids. So. Ooh. Yeah. I good, watched a lot. Hey, good times. <laughs> but So we just had a reunion. We just filmed it a couple weeks ago. It'll be airing probably in a month or something. Yeah. I can't keep up. It's a lot. It, there's on a Instagram, lot going on. Them, there's yeah. a lot, and they're adding people. They add people. Sort of, they they brought Mackenzie back around, who was the girl married to the rodeo guy. If you remember that from, we had a team mom three for a minute. Yeah, if you remember that, and she yeah. was on that, and and then uh, it's just there's a lot of stuff going on, and the, there was a lot. Uh, well, I will tell a little story. Yeah. So, uh, Butch is having a little trouble, which I think you can kind of see on this season. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And Butch is Caitlin and Tyler's. Tyler's dad and her step her uh, father-in-law. And uh, I started getting into it with Butch in the reunion. I'm not really like, it's time, man. I, I, I just, I, when people that I know that are good in recovery and that have done it well and know what it is and they just start bullshitting around, I just, I just, it's like, come on, man. And and in the middle of really like laying it down with him and he never getting into it a bit. And, and his daughter too is really in recovery and she was letting him have it. The blackout hit. That New York blackout <gasps> oh, no. was right in the middle of this whole thing with Butch. It was ridiculous. And the whole place goes dark. And we're all sitting there with an audience, unable to do anything. 
we just been screaming at each other and uh we sat there for another 30 minutes trying to figure out what was going on and then they just dismissed everybody that is a great intervention story it was quite a story and, and i was belched out into times square and i've never seen anything like that it was crazy. I'm surprised they don't have like generators in the studio. They had a little bit of light eventually, uh, and the, but the generators couldn't. Well, this was this is a live TV broadcast booth, and oh you're right. God. All every other broadcast booth in the country has generators, so they can continue to broadcast live during some sort of disaster. Except the MTV broadcast booth, they don't have generators. Maybe Butch has powers. So so it just went down. The whole thing went down, and we had to wait till the next day and sort of finish things up and whatever. But anyway, I, I think love the him. last time I watched, he had a year or something. Yeah. And then I feel like he relapsed at the end. I you heard him start to talk about pot and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm on marijuana maintenance. Like, oh, really? That's going to work. It always works for a real drug yeah. addict. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. And so, and I love him. I think he's just great. And I just, I just don't have patience when people are good in recovery and wonderful people. And I know what they've got to offer. And they just start bullshitting. It's, just, it's hard, to, hard to be around. But, uh, I can't wait to talk about all this stuff. Let's talk about uh, you want to go ahead. Yeah. You have a little uh, recovery. Well, yes. So I'm a teenage mom. Yeah. Meth addict. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever do a mashup of all of your shows, I it's am you. available for that. Yeah. So, so we slip in rehab and teen mom. We put mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. parents were addicts when I was a kid. Uh, trauma tra from that? A lot of trauma. Just being around addicts or was there actual um, heavier shit? Well, my disclosure is that my parents are great. I love them very much. They're both clean and active in my oh, life cool. right now, but I've been kind of sorting through. Look, they know the carnage of their disease. Right. Yeah. And just kind of, I, I found that I have ex like accepted things too fast in my life, like rushed to acceptance. Fl a flight to, flight to recovery or flight yeah, to health. Yeah. And yeah. then um have kind of just repressed a lot of stuff so i've been sorting through that for the last uh year or so uh parents lived on opposite sides of the country after my mom left when i was two mm -hmm. so i lived with my dad and four men Oof. it was actually great i was very sheltered i was very well taken care of for for male addicts no 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 uh. I, I, so my dad just partied. My ah. dad got sober and he's one of these people that when he got sober, he was like, I had a problem, but everyone else is like, you know, his he problem's all using. inside. Yeah. He, so he may, maybe more, he was just, <clears throat> maybe he was the co, he was the using buddy for your mom. Yeah. He was just, he was an alcoholic <clears throat> oh, and okay. he different. was still a great person. And Plenty are. I didn't see a ton of. No, when he got sober, he's just one of these people that when he got sober, everyone else was like, you were fine. You know, so it was like something inside of him, like the, the whole inside of him. So when I'm five, I'm mad because I didn't get a mom. I don't think I remembered the actual mom because mm. she left when I was two. So he takes me to my mom and leaves me with my mom. Mm. And she's using at the time? She's using. I think she pretended not to use. I don't know. What's her drug? She, uh, meth. Yeah. Crank, whatever it was. It was something different back then. And now I think... I have a lot of abandonment issues. And I think I didn't know who she was. I remember feeling like I couldn't go home because then he just left me with her. And I think now in 2019, we would know this child hasn't seen this woman in three years. We can't just drop her off with this person. Scary. This will be traumatic. Scary, yeah. Because I see a loop. I see a pattern in my life where I play out the same cycle in relationships where I leave men every three years and then make them come get me. Oof. And I can't believe that they love me if they haven't chased me across the country. Isn't that crazy how yeah. exact that is? Yeah. And when you're in it, you probably cannot see it. No, I can't see it. I can't, I can't perceive that they love me. And it was only recently when I recently did it for the who knows how many of time that I, it, the pain felt so much deeper than the relationship pain which, should which feel it, which it is and it was the first time because i keep my dad on a pedestal and my dad is amazing it was the first time that i realized five-year-old me probably didn't understand a who this woman was b why i was being left here i asked for my mom i didn't understand that she lived across the country and that meant i couldn't be with my dad mm. i probably laid in a bed and and longed for my dad to come get me and that's why I'm I'm trying to like wake myself up to this. Did he ever come and do anything, rescue you in any way? I would go out there for the summer and he would always ought like, do you want to come home? But for in my head, I just had it. I couldn't go home. I wasn't allowed. For some reason, it felt like a punishment or something. I had done something to deserve this. I wasn't wanted. By him? 
Or is we period? We were, I didn't feel wanted by her. So were you afraid of leaving mom? Like something will happen to her? No. I think I felt. I feel there's a possibility that it was ex- like because I asked to be with her, like I had to stay there. I see. You're you're bad for having done that. Got yeah. It. Got it. Got it. So shortly after I move in with her, we move to a different house. I meet my new best friend and I start getting molested by her dad. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you guys like this comedy <laughs> podcast? <laughs> Buckle up. She's just getting started. Uh, and so is this in your comedy, by the way, some of this stuff? Yeah. Okay, I good. can't, all of my comedy good. is sad. I can, I only care about comedy if I can take you to the brink of crying and then bring you back. Good, Otherwise, good. I like it. Who gives a shit? Um, and so, and this fucker, uh, was he also molesting his daughter? He was also molesting his daughter. I heard him rape his wife. He was a monster. But he was like up in a church, like something in a church. Oh I want to say God. bishop. And this is the 80s. This is the early 80s. I hope when he's dead. He is dead. Oh, hell I'd like to think I have something to do with that. Oh, what happened? Um, I don't know. You stuck, you stuck a spick in his head? <laughs> I, did have a, I had a friend. I've, I've kept some, uh, you know, shady company over the years. And so I don't know the, the circumstances of his death. But in my fantasy world, uh, it was a friend of mine that took him out. Um, what is the statute of limitations? How many times I have Googled the statute of limitations after a podcast? Oh my God. I did Bert Kreischer's podcast and said something that then I went and did another podcast and spent that entire podcast Googling statute of limitations. And how did, how did just to amuse me, how did Bert react to all this? What did Bert keep Wait, wait, so wait, 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 so wait, so wait. That was Bert during the whole what? podcast. No. <laughs> um, okay, so this fucker starts. Uh, this guy starts molesting me. Uh, he uses, and you have nobody you can turn to, and you've already felt you were bad. Don't so. feel like I'm safe yeah. talking to my mom, which yeah. he, you know, perfect victim for this sort of thing. Yeah. Didn't want to give up the friendship with the friend, and kind of didn't know I was being molested in the beginning. And then was it, it just weird touching or did he it actually... was, you know, intrusive fingers and every single morning before I could get on the bus, he would force me to sit on his lap and kind of uh, grind into me. And then when I would try to get up, he would like whisper, like shaming things like into what? my ear, like your hair stinks. Doesn't your mom ever take care of you? You know, and so this becomes a critical companion, right? Another loop in my mind is that I seek out indoctrinated men uh, who I don't fit into what a woman should be for them. So uh, you're flawed in some Yeah, my way first husband was like a pastor's kid and stuff. Yeah, also this loop, because this guy used my... Um, so so he, he was an anointed church member. Uh-huh. And, and you, I was just a gross from the wrong you, side of the track. You were the thing that were making him dirty. Mm-hmm. So you have to do that to other men. Yeah. It is strange to look back on these memories and remember the first time he ever inappropriately touched me, him like blaming me. And I thought, I wonder if... In what sense? Just like, um, he was he was drying me off. I was wet and I had a romper on. This is... And uh, he was touching me inappropriately, but then like, why don't you have panties on? You're supposed to have panties on. And I always thought of that, like him shaming me. And then I'm like, oh, I wonder if I was just watching him getting mad at himself feeling dirty you know like like acting out on something that was wrong with him and well yes. running his own shame cycle y- yes but, but definitely projecting fuck it onto him me. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no 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 i'm not not swimming in forgiveness yeah right? okay <laughs> not for this guy <laughs> okay you want to talk about pieces of shit let's talk about my fourth grade teacher it keeps going oh we haven't even scratched the surface does this have to only be an hour um fourth grade teacher i watch I find out that I'm being molested because we had to watch one of these. This is early 80s. So they start showing us these mm, programs on the TV or whatever like, about inappropriate touch. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, shit. So-and-so's dad's doing that to me. I go to the teacher and I'm like, so-and-so's dad is doing this to me. All right. So uh, back a little bit. As soon as this guy starts molesting me, I develop an inner dialogue uh, obsessed with attention. And this will show them was the catchphrase of this voice. And so I would do a lot of outlandish things. I went to visit my dad once and pretended to be a dog the entire time. Wow. Kind of disconnected from reality a little bit, wow. which becomes a theme. And I was did a lot of stuff for attention, kind of obsessed with attention. So by the time I go to this teacher, we are a year and a half, two years into me getting molested. 
And I know when I'm telling this teacher, like eight-year-old, nine-year-old me knows that my credibility is shot. I understand that this person is going to need backup because I'm not credible enough I see. to tell on this person. So I get you, another you were a behavior problem for the teacher, maybe. Yeah, but like not really. I, I got when but, I got but, but she, yeah. She thought that. Attention seeking. Yeah. I knew that she would think I was lying. And so I got a friend who was also getting molested by this guy. And we told her and then she would bring me back to do weekly updates on my abuse for the rest of that school year and into the next year. I'm like someone else's student and she would bring me in without and have me tell reporting her, it. And she never reported it. That's beyond bizarre. I can like I could see where everyone else was in this situation and how everyone else failed me and why it makes sense that everyone was where they were at. And then I, this is the one person that I'm like, it doesn't, it couldn't have been that she was like friends with him because she, he continued to it molest It makes me him. wonder, I, I, you know, as someone who spoke about childhood sexual abuse for all through those decades, I, I was actively shamed and told that I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. And, and you know, this was people just talking about it more. It doesn't really happen. And then this whole thing about false memories came up. And so I wonder if that teacher was following some sort of weird policy that was around at the time. Early eighties. Yeah. So where, it was, where they were they you know weren't believing kids. This right. Was a coke Ex dealer's daughter exactly. against a pastor. Or Which whatever. is I'm just going to support her and let her tell her story and yeah. see if this you know something emerges. Who knows? And also back then, when a lot of this stuff came out as. Um, as an adult, when I needed to go back and revisit this, a lot of it, the difference between how we understood reality in 2019 beside, um, against how we understood it in the 80s yeah. was it was like, yeah, but you lied all the time. And it's like, yeah, because I was getting molested. Right. I was trying to get people's right. attention. Right. So I end up telling someone else. It comes out. That teacher yells at me. I end up having to tell my mom. My mom says, look, we can't go to the cops like they're not going to believe us and she's right because she's an addict she's an addict she's a drug dealer he knows she's a drug uh, dealer i was he hmm? he the cop would know that no the um oh the abuser the abuser uh, knew so that. they won't no one will believe you. oh jesus and so other weird things that we talked about how different the scene was back in the 80s this wasn't like a bad neighborhood or anything but he had beaten his wife at one point and she ran down the street with like a black eye like bloody nose and back in the 80s it was just like oh they're having a fight you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, right. it, I would never let my kids back at that house again. But back then we were just like, no, domestic you know, violence and abuse of children. We didn't have that word yet. Did we? Not really. I, it, it was, it, it was bad. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, I, I really believe that a lot of the problems we're dealing with today is because of that, what I consider to be a pandemic of childhood trauma. Yeah. And it's, it's interpersonal trauma. It's not like we went through a war. It's we had the people that were you're supposed to trust for your well-being and love were the ones either setting up or perpetrating the trauma. Yeah. And nothing more shattering than that. Yeah. So I, I, I just that's all I've talked to my whole career. And so it, I, I feel like it is getting better for the very reason you're just saying, you know, yeah. like you wouldn't let your kids near any of this just stuff. the awareness yeah. now of the effect. And I think if you didn't have a generation of traumatized kids, we are, you know, so much more mindful in our parenting as yeah. a result and also one thing i've said about like my first psychic ability my first intuitive ability was after getting molested if a creep walks within uh well, 100 miles of me i know it's interesting that having trauma does create sort of what you want to call psychic abilities how else does it manifest um how else does the psychic abilities manifest? yeah because usually people get a bunch of interesting intuitive abilities because you, of horrible things yeah. when it happens um you and ryan sickler actually talked about me on the honeydew podcast okay um i'm the meth addict that talked to aliens tell me more um, it's a okay so, was that when you were psychotic with meth or mm -hmm. okay well that yeah. happens a lot. i mean they still talk that's not, me, but, but the, oh um, mm, well <laughs> Tell me more. Uh, all right, so now we'll play a game called uh, "Is She Schizophrenic or Enlightened?" Because this is or my just favorite le game. left over from meth. Yeah. So on part of what led me to do drugs, I, I tried meth on accident at, after a gig. I thought I was just doing a bump of coke, but I was already very destructive by this point. A gig, comedy gig. Mm hmm. I started doing comedy when I was twenty-one, and then I was pretty much immediately on the road. I was a professional comedian within nine times of doing nice. comedy on accident. That's a psychic ability. Yeah. I actually started doing comedy because I had lied and told some coworkers that I do comedy and they showed up at the open mic to support me. And I was like, well, I guess I do comedy now. Do you still have trouble with truth? 
No. Um, kind of went along with that attention seeking thing. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm still very much. Sure. Back but then, I was someone who, if you told a story, I would like adopt it yeah. as my own story. Yeah, yeah. And then I went through this alien experience and became kind of a different version of myself and then life also became so absurd that i didn't really need to borrow what does that mean else's, uh stories anymore um all right so i have a near-death experience in 2000 about six months into doing drugs from doing what what you have a heart attack or something or i think it could have been ghb i don't remember taking ghb but we had bottles of ghb all over the place so i have a few theories of what it could have been i don't know that I guess meth kills people, but at all, yeah, yeah, I, d I say it doesn't. And then people in YouTube comments are like, well, most meth, meth addicts, it, 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 det you would deteriorate on meth right. and most meth addicts die in violence, it, mm -hmm. committing violence or being perpetrated yep. against. Yeah. A and you can, you can deteriorate so much if you're also smoking cigarettes and other stuff where you can have cardiac stuff, but that's not typical. Yeah. Not typical. So that most of the people I lost were they got shot yeah. something like that yeah. now once i got clean on the east coast and was in recovery with heroin addicts i've lost a hundred friends from recovery to relapses because yeah. opiates kill you know, easily buy. kill easily yeah. Yeah. yeah so um anyway i have a near-death experience and i don't know a ton of details about it you know, do you know the dopey guys in the east yeah that's how we is that how we got together mm -hmm. so, i don't know so yeah. did you know chris no i did their podcast once uh. And then Dave called me back right okay. after okay, uh, Chris had died. Yeah, that's. Yeah. I had lost two people that week when he called me and it's told just me. Just so horrible. It's at least one a week. Yeah. Um. I. Okay, so I have this near death experience. I end up in this big blue ball of light. At this point, I've already done a five year stint in Christianity, and I believe myself to be a backslidden Christian. <laughs> and I. Um. I want to keep him. <laughs> I. Um, I'm in the blue ball of light. I am myself, but I'm a part of this blue ball of light. And my entire life, I've had this kind of homesickness going in the background. Sure. Could be caused by trauma though, right? Well, and, but you were, you were, you were without yeah, a home. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm in the blue ball of light and I feel home. This yeah. feels like the place yeah. I've waited for my yeah. entire life. I've heard other people describe that. The, the light tells me not in words, but gets translated to words later. Yeah. You did everything you went to do. You learned everything you went to learn. You can stay here if you want, or if you want to go back, we got something cool that you can do. Okay. For some fucking reason, Just I to came do back. this show. I, yeah. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was I was twenty two. Twenty two year old me totally would have come back to meet Doctor Joe. <laughs> um, and then I come back, and for the rest of my addiction, I am in what we have named on other podcasts, Alien School. Mm. And in alien school, while I'm dreaming, while I'm sleep dreaming, which sleep, you know, like uh, sleep is weird when you're on meth. Well, you have hypnagogic hallucinations. Ooh, what's that? It's like, like it, it, you've ever had sleep paralysis where you yes. wake up and you feel like you can't move and mm -hmm. there's something lying on top of you and mm -hmm. you can see that something. People have various manifestations of what they're seeing. That thing may or may not have sex with you. It may or may not be threatening to you, but they have very characteristic forms that people see when they're in this hypnagogic hallucination. It's, it's a sleep state. Okay. Yeah, I would call that, I would call that twilight sleep. It's like a, doesn't feel but, like all the way sleep, doesn't right. feel like all the Your way Your eyes dreams. are open, but you're frozen. Mm -hmm. It's because you're still in sleep. Yeah, so they taught me a bunch of stuff. The, the sleep people. I call them aliens. Okay. I think woo-woo people call them guides. And according to them, we live in some type of video. Listen, I was like, I'm not going to talk about aliens on Dr. Drew. <laughs> this was already booked. I was like, I'm not going to talk. Jessa, and, and here you we are, are not going to. You're going to get through one fucking podcast <laughs> without talking about aliens. And well, then, oh, Bert will come in here and go, why did you talk to yeah. about the aliens? <laughs> <laughs> and then Ryan brought it up. And I was like, God damn it. I'm going <laughs> to talk about the aliens. So they say that we are living in a 3D fear-based reality that was based on dichotomies where we don't remember that we're playing a video game. It's essentially a video game. Mm -hmm. And that we are going into a higher level of consciousness where we all kind of merge our consciousness back together again and that I would assist in this process or whatever. And so they taught me a bunch of stuff, a bunch of stuff I have used, a bunch of stuff I have not able to use yet. Like I- Like what? how to move things with my eyes and how to levitate. I can't do it yet. Okay. We're still in this goddamn 3D. <laughs> so. and, and but what, like I can feel where I would do it. And, and what and what uh, they teach you that was useful? Um, how to hear people's thoughts. It feels like 
subtext. So a lot of people can do it. A lot of people don't know that they can do it. So when someone's talking, I mean, you, of course, this is like a gift you've had your entire life, but like someone's Not talking my entire to life. you. It came, came late. It came late. Did yeah. you learn it? I learned it by, uh, I'm super sensitive to other people. I learned it by being an object of scrutiny in therapy by an excellent therapist and it developed. Okay. And then I found I could do that for other people. Okay. So when someone's talking to you about why they need to break up with their girlfriend and they're self-deceiving and they're telling you all of these reasons, but you can hear. I can hear with my body. That's the way I look at it. Okay. I, I like he, they, I hear with my ears, but I listen with my whole body. Okay. So, so do you believe in things like clairvoyance and clairaudience? Yeah. But I they're think just not that woo, right? They're just. To, to me, there's something about our right brain. That's why I'm, my wife has a bunch of psychic friends and yeah. I'm interested in looking at them and studying them and, and figuring out what they're doing because they all kind of do the same thing. And there's something about our right brain that makes us able, I think it's that we're sort of reading each other. We There's so much more going on in our brain that we are consciously aware of. Yes. And that I think we pick up a lot from other people that we're not aware of that if we could figure out how to tune into it, it would be very enlightening. This makes me so excited. Yeah. Okay, so what if we have these other senses and we have mm -hmm. been, my understanding is that we're downloading higher and higher levels of them and but what if we've always had them and we just didn't know about them no one ever taught us to these use abilities them. we're taught to dismiss well, them maybe they developed from evolutionary biology in some fashion and maybe it was the primary way we survived in the world at one time uh and it's continued to evolve but it's evolved sort of beneath the surface in ways that is not apparent to humanity right now because our conscious brain is sort of in the way of us seeing these things yeah do you know and about then, ifs internal family systems no. so when i was 14 i was in the mental hospital and i told us the custom yeah <laughs> you know like you do when you're 14. <laughs> these are the kind of things that like i was making shit up and then later well, i was like everyone didn't spend their freshman year in a <laughs> mental ward but but when when i say that as a trauma survivor you probably have lots of interesting sort of psychic abilities you're telling us about these things that, that i'm used to hearing from people that have trauma yeah yours yours has a little more of um story elements to it yeah. let's say it's more it, it has more story but but there's not a, not uncommon people to have all kinds of stuff like this that they can tune into i used to be kind of sensitive about people thinking i was crazy and so i kept it pretty quiet and well I could, if you ever couldn't differentiate it from and in something that you're just sort of listening to if it yeah. took over that'd be crazy so that's the determining factor between schizophrenia and if you you, if you can't tell the difference Okay. Schizophrenia, you don't have schizophrenia. Right. Because that's something that develops 18 to 22. Okay. What you might have is something left over from the meth. You might have an injury that's giving you all this stuff, making you see all this stuff. Yeah. Would there be a part of my brain that could have been injured? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and by injured, I'm not saying destroyed or adverse. You just gave you some interesting experiences. Yeah. I mean, it makes me fun at parties. Makes you very fun. Very fun for podcasting too. I just think about different things. Like when I was eight, I felt driven to run into a pole and hit my head in the same spot four days in a row. I probably would have been more than four days in a row, but on Thursday they were like, yeah, we're gonna need you to take her home for a long weekend. <laughs> Stop by the hospital, get her something for her concussion. And then I got hit by a car right after that. Was that right before that? I don't know, I got hit by the back of the car, so I just wasn't paying attention. But, Weird how that might have been a traumatic reenactment of the car episode. Yeah. It's just strange like I was trying to get, maybe I was trying to dislodge the chip. No, or something. because you're always, you, your whole thing is traumatic reenactments. Yeah. That is my thing. Yeah. Damn it. I got to stop getting divorced so I stop getting married. <laughs> That's my new strategy. Can't get married if you're not divorced. How many times are you married? Just kidding. Two. I got married when That's I was 16. Not much. That's not a lot. I know. I'm just kidding. It's minor league. And your kids are good? Yeah. And how are you as a mom? Right. Good. Um, Does any of this stuff get in the way of that? Like the depression must have been rough. Postpartum is rough. Do you talk about that on Teen Mom? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, Caitlin had every, a lot of them. Had, had oh, yeah. It. Yeah. With yeah. Caitlin. I, um, it's, a, it's a really rough illness. And, and yeah. not, not, women are not given enough support and education about it. It's almost psychosis. It can be. There, there is such thing as postpartum psychosis. And, and it can be brutal. 
I've recently learned that I'm codependent. I knew that I had attachment issues. I mostly am someone who is detached. I'm mostly someone who has a hard time attaching to people. I have a really hard time with being touched. Sex and intimacy is very difficult for me. But if you do happen to be one of the three people to ever exist that I can connect with in that way, I get very codependently is attached. It, is it only the unavailable types that you tend to get attached that way to? I, yeah. We end up in a thing, but I don't know if they are always unavailable. I, two said of they them need to go across country. I tend to push them. Oh. I go across the country. Oh, 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 I see. And I tend to push away to yeah. the point that it's really hard to tell who, yeah. who is what. But when I am, it feels like an activation. And I recently figured out that the, I have codependently activated on two of my siblings also what do you call activation I don't know what that like is. needing to control the situation obsessive thoughts one time it was a, a sibling who was relapsing and another time it was a sibling who was in a narcissistic relationship sure, I and it. i got like an unhealthy attachment to the situation needing to rescue them needing to parent them got needing it. to control the situation you identify a little too strongly too and i can look back and see how both of those times it got triggered by whatever crisis they were in would result in them leaving me so I was very close to the sister who got involved with the narcissist. As soon as he started to hurt her, she kind of started to pull away from me. Sure. And I like click in. Got it. I and she, and she's in like a cult of two. She's in a domestic violence situation. Yeah. Isolating her. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah. like rapidly sending her articles about narcissism and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one just wasn't ready to get clean. I was, it was me in early recovery, which I was the worst. <laughs> Were you a book thumper? Just. <laughs> self-righteous you were drinking your own pee six <laughs> months ago maybe step out from behind the pulpit were you for drinking a your second. own pee to make sure you got every molecule of meth back listen or was it just a psychosis the lawyers at comedy central said this is instructional but <laughs> your body doesn't break down meth i know is that why you were doing it and i read that in an article and was like that's right yo we're throwing away so much meth hey it's uh eight times concentrated in semen yeah, it's like a psychedelic, though. It's a very different high. Oh, interesting. That was my bottom, I guess. I didn't really realize it was my bottom. I kind of, meh, out of addiction. <laughs> <Done wars. laughs> <laughs> but But so other than recovery, you had any treatment? No, and I really didn't need... Um, all right, here's what... This is nobody else's experience is this. I got bored. Of recovery? I got bored of meth and just quit. And then I moved across the country. My dad was sober. I hadn't seen them in five years. My dad th you know, thought I was dead on multiple occasions. And I mean, I was on meth. And I just felt, I went out and visited him because he bought my new teeth. And then I as I was- I was ask about the teeth, yes. Yeah, this is actually, this is an import, um, import supported thing that I got from a dentist named Brady Smith who watched me glue my old dentures in like a gross ass on Burt Kreischer's podcast. We started talking. I was like, oh, this is going to be a lot of mouth noises. Hold on a second. It pulled him out. I glued him in while Burt, who had met me five minutes before that, was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and I was like, you're going to edit that out, right? Hey, you know what? I, I forget Bert and his wife coming up on the podcast. I, I, I want Bert and Jesse together <laughs> on the podcast, please. We'll, we'll do uh, both. Yeah, okay. I want to meet his wife. I keep yeah. texting him. He's very busy. But I was like, can I meet your wife? Um, but yeah, he was like, yeah, totally. We'll edit it out. And then he yeah. did not edit it out. Of course. Which Bert. thank God, because I got, I don't know, it was just $20,000 worth of shit in my mouth. Anyway, yeah. So this very generous dentist who has like a podcast where he gives away. Oh, wow. Uh, Should we stuff. say his name just to Brady say thank Smith you? Brady Smith. Okay, in thank Big, you. He has a um, drilled podcast. Okay. So yeah, these are, these are pretty fly. They're nice. Yeah. And I don't have to glue them in. So that's sick. Do so you have a hook or something? You have a metal there thing? There are four implants, yeah. which means no more bone loss. Yeah, yeah. And then they just pop in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're porcelain. They're mm, not. Nice. Whatever. We have to take a little break from the show so I can tell you about our friends at stamps.com. We'll start with stamps. And uh, we were early adopters of stamps. I, I think I've told you before that uh, one day I was looking at some letters on my desk and there were kids, pictures of my kids on the stamps. I was like, oh my God, my wife is counterfeiting stamps. She's like, no, no, it's stamps.com. This was years ago. I was like, this was a magic to me that we could print stamps on our computer at home and they could, she could tell me what a, a particular letter, the postage should be on that letter. That was just like wizardry back then. But now it's one of the most common 
uh, time-saving devices to small businesses at stamps.com. Anything you could do at the post office, you, you can do with stamps. Plus, they have promotions and other things you can't get anyplace else. So why would you go waste your time at the post office? They get up to 5%, excuse me, 5 cents off every first class stamp, up to 40% off priority mail. Not to mention it's a fraction of the cost of these expensive meters. You don't want to do that anymore. Stamps is a no-brainer. You save money, you save mo uh, same time. And it's no wonder that over 700,000 small businesses use stamps.com. And right now, our listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial. That is a free postage and digital scale without any long-term commitment. Think about that. Postage is like money. They're like giving you four weeks. For that four-week trial, they're giving you money in the form of postage and a digital scale with no long-term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in Dr. Drew, D-R-D-R-E-W. Again, that is stamps.com. Enter Dr. Drew for that four-week trial plus free postage plus that scale. By the way, you plug that scale into your computer so you can weigh any postage or package and the computer will tell you exactly what that postage should be print up the stamps off it goes just call your mailman to come pick it up for you or stick it out in your mailbox it is stamps.com save money save time our next product is hymns for hymns i think you guys have heard of this product uh and let's remind ourselves that uh, for most men 40 percent or so above the age of 40 struggle with erectile function and men will do anything to avoid being straightforward and just dealing with it as a physician, uh, usually it's a patient's wife that brings them in for treatment. Uh, now, guys, you don't have to even come and see, see the doctor. You can use the innovation called the Internet. You, we have new digital ways of handling this. And so here's the deal. Hims connects you with an actual licensed physician, and they then refer you, if appropriate, to FDA-approved pharmaceutical products that are of course, the kind of products you're used to hearing about that treat erectile dysfunction. These are well-known generic equivalents to the name brand that you've heard of before. You don't have to worry about multiple office visits. You don't have to worry about any uncomfortable visits to your doctor. This is this is innovation, and I, I this is efficiency in medical care, and I endorse this. I think it's not a bad idea at all. Try Hims for a month today for just five dollars. We'll get you started for just five dollars while supplies last. Prescription products are subject to the physician approval, of course. They require an online consultation with a doctor who will determine whether the prescription is appropriate. And gentlemen, it's a very common problem, and uh, it needs a, it's a medical problem. It's a medical solution. As I said, 40% of men over 40, nearly 100% of men over 60, men with prostate cancer, men with heart disease, medication side effects. There is no reason you shouldn't take care of this simply. You can see the website for full details and safety information. This could cost a lot, right? It could cost hundreds of dollars if you went in person to the doctor and then the pharmacy. Go to forhims.com. It's F O R H I M S dot com slash D R D R E W. It is forhims.com slash Dr. Drew. Tell him I sent you. And now back to the show. Um, so you're meeting your dad, you're on meth. I meet my dad. I go, I see my dad. I had to do all my meth at the airport because. So I have a fake ID to get on an airplane for a flight I've already missed. Yeah. The fake ID has a line printed to it. It's a fake ID with my own information, but right. I was like nowhere near high functioning enough to make it to the DMV. Oh, got it. I've been living outside of society for many years. I somehow get away with this fake ID. Are you on the streets? No, I weirdly had people gave me cars and houses and stuff. I was very entertaining uh -huh. to have around uh -huh. and very confusing for the police. Uh -huh. So people kept me around just because if the cops came in, I would be like, the collective consciousness sent me to awaken a <laughs> tribe. I'm glad you guys are here. I believe you are what is called an image setter. And the oh. cops were like, oh, God, this isn't worth the meth lab. <sighs> oh. So I give the fake ID. While I'm standing there, I realize I have a meth pipe in my bra. As is the custom. So I put the meth pipe in the trash can. But apparently the standard operating procedure for stashing a meth pipe in a trash can bears a striking resemblance to maybe putting a bomb in a trash can. Oh, also, it's no. 2005. I've been off the rails since 99. Oh. I haven't been in an airport since 9-11. Uh-oh. I then go to the bathroom, and I, I drop my luggage off, and then I see them surrounding the trash can. So I go in the bathroom. I have to do all my drugs. I spend two weeks in Delaware with my parents with no drugs, and I sober up enough to realize that all these things, I was never going to quit. And all these things I attributed to drugs, me being smart and never before believing I'm smart, me being interesting, me being funny, me not needing attention, all these things, 
I realize I'm these things sober and I start to think, oh shit, am I about to quit meth? And then I say something just a little bit to my dad and he gets a little bit excited talking about recovery. And I'm like, never mind, I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then the most brilliant thing you could ever say to me, he's dropping me off at the airport and he says, if you get home and realize that this lifestyle is a little stale, you can always come back. Now here's the thing about me. I'll do anything in as long as it's new. The nightmare that I was trying to escape by doing drugs in the first place was this hamster wheel that it felt like everyone else was on. Right. So to imply that I had already been around this track and that I was actually just on my own hamster wheel was brilliant because it just put a crack in the foundation. I got home. My boyfriend was fucking the other chick. It was pictures of it on the digital camera. He oh brought my, my friends, you know, and I was so like, you're a drug addict. He must be a drug addict too. Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. I didn't talk to anybody that wasn't on drugs. Yeah, sure. And I'm like, this is stale. This is stale. Meth is boring. I'm going to move to Delaware. <laughs> 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 no one has ever said that. Um, I'm going to go I'm, somewhere exciting, like Dover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I get on the airplane, I still think I'm going to do meth. I still have arranged for other people to sure. bring me drugs. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Portland is the problem. And boyfriend is the problem. And You're in Portland, Oregon at the time? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where I played out all of the, the meth days. Great yeah. place to play out yeah, the meth yeah, days. Yeah. It's a hell mouth. Yeah. I am on the airplane and I just have this kind of moment of clarity where I'm like, the tweakers are never going to send you the meth. You're going to Western Union tweakers money. Right. You've watched tweakers try to get to a post office before. It's never going to happen. And if you do get the meth, are you going to be high in Delaware alone? Isn't that going to be irritating? And I thought... I'll quit. And that was it. Mm. And I never. And you got in the program or no? I didn't need it. I didn't want it. I didn't need it to stay clean. I had no desire to use. But then my dad was really excited about taking me. I thought I would drink again. And I remember he w took me to play pool. And he was like, is it, you know, we didn't say triggering back then. But is it hard to be in a bar? And I thought, oh, God, does he think I'm not going to drink? But I was just being very strategic. It's like I'm coming down off of speed. You got the wah, 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 and the nightmare and shit. I'm not going to do a downer. And then he took me to the one fellowship that's too straight-laced. And uh, I remember someone said, you know, my name's Jude, and I'm an alcoholic. And everyone said, hey, Jude. Uh, and then I lost hysterical. my mind and had to leave that meeting. <laughs> And I was like, I don't like it. I don't want to do that. And then he took me to the other fellowship and the first person that shared, oh, crippling social anxiety. Oh. As soon as I get clean, oh, crippling yeah. social anxiety. Yeah. And I hear the first person share, who's like, yo, my fucking parole officers all on my dick. Just <laughs> fucking with me constantly. And I was like, oh my God, I feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> my I can hang out with these people. So it was a great place for me to reenter society sure. socially. Uh, but I'm wondering if you had any other treatment. Is there, mm -hmm. Have you this been looked at in any way? Okay. And do you feel like you want to reintegrate some of this stuff? Or you had so much trauma. Yeah. I mean, I am constantly. I mean, that can be treated. Yeah. I'm constantly working on it. I'm in therapy, but oh, most okay. of my That's therapy. What I mean by oh, okay. Sorry. I thought you meant drug treatment. Well, no, 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 no. Most of my therapy sessions are like, all right, so I read six self-help books since the last time I saw you. I've realized that I'm codependent. Like her hair is just blowing <laughs> back, you know. I don't, it's difficult for a person I'm only seeing once a week to move at the speed of Jessa. But they, I am. Do they do any EMDR or trauma therapy? I would love to do EMDR. I think I am going to do. Yeah. Something it could like be a little that. overwhelming for you. What, EMDR, what is that? EMDR, it's, it's a thing where you do a certain little eye movement. It's a way of accessing some of this traumatic material and processing it um, in ways that your brain won't let you just sitting talking about it. Essentially, that's what it is. Yeah. And for some people, it can be really, I mean, stuff can kind of flow to the point where it just becomes like too much. Yeah. I would, I worry about that kind of stuff. Uh, but you can try it. I mean, if you just get overwhelmed by it, just slow it down. Yeah. So. I feel like the last two years especially have been huge growth. I Right now, I was kind of worried about doing this podcast because I'm usually quite aloof and I now feel like I have a duffel bag of feelings that I'm dragging around. Like I unearthed enough stuff to realize, oh, I do have feelings. They just, I didn't register. They were, you were I'm disconnected. Like so you were disconnected from them. Yeah. Because that's the trauma again. Trauma yeah. just disconnects you. One thing that really, I watched you recently 
just a clip of you and Doug Stanhope where Doug Stanhope says, did you hear all the things I said about you? And you said, no, I'm sensitive, so I don't look at what people say about me on the internet. And this was a huge moment for me because I, up until I saw you say that, because you're someone I respect, someone I think is very confident and smart, and I, I respect the way your mind works. Up until that point, I would force myself to read every single YouTube mm. comment about me. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine the things people say about mm -hmm. me. Uh, crackhead, you know, crazy. Um, I would force myself to read it because I felt like if I don't, if I'm hiding from it, then I'm not actually okay. Yeah, that's that's. Which is actually a weird thing. I'm like, like weirdly. That's you. I'm not right. I'm not good. Yeah. I need to punish myself again. Yeah, like I don't have to. I don't have to look at that. I don't no. have to force myself to be okay no. with it. So that's been a great. And I really tuned in to how much anxiety that was kind of causing. Oh my god, it's so brutal. Under, yeah. It's so brutal. I I do feel like you are able to connect to some feelings though. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is a pretty recent. Do you though. hate it? It's like, it's like I'm in a new control. I have a new control room and I'm just kind of learning where all the things are yeah. and I'm realizing how, so my marriage ended suddenly, my marriage ended suddenly, my very good marriage, 10 years of just great marriage, mm. didn't have that weird cycle and it ended because he got in a car accident and his personality changed overnight. Oh and my we just God. just suddenly weren't compatible. Car injury, a head injury? Mm -hmm. <gasps> and it was like minor. Oh so my we God. didn't even know what was happening at first and oh we just God. weren't compatible anymore and it was a very rough nine months for both of us it was very sad Ugh. it was right as my comedy central thing was coming out so we had to move across the country and so in six months time i didn't have a husband anymore and i have a podcast where we mostly dig through our trauma and at one point my podcast partner who's three years into mourning his his marriage right says you don't think you're sad about your marriage ending and i was like no i don't want to get back together like that's how many categories of reason i had for feelings i was like well if i was sad i would want to get back together i don't want to get back together so what am i going to be sad for like mm. that's just i just like if it didn't fit logically i i didn't i was definitely sad as it was happening it was traumatic as it was happening but i i would give myself very little time to just sit in the this is just sad. This is the thing that we had. It was great. And now it's gone. And that's sad. I'm going to give myself that. And so now I'm realizing how many things are shame. I'm realizing how many things are feeling unwanted. I'm noticing as I notice the fear of being unwanted, I see it in weird places like that minute, that half a minute after you pay at the grocery store and then you're done, but you still have to get the change into your wallet is an intense flailing for me. It almost always ends up with the change on the floor. It could be the social anxiety though, right? Yeah. Well, a lot of the social anxiety is perceiving that I'm unwanted. And, and so and shame. in that moment, and shame, this, shame being seen, mm -hmm. do you hide? I try. Mm. And so I flail so hard because this person doesn't want me here. This person doesn't want me here. I see everything in like a fisheye lens. Um, comedy sometimes gets affected by the social anxiety. I've done what does the comedy do for you? No. That's a weird, I don't like it. You don't like comedy? <laughs> I don't. It's a weird, it's, I feel like comedy comes and gets me all the time and then I'm like, fine. And it's, I have a strange relationship with it. I don't get that ego boost that I used to get from it. It comes and gets you. I quit comedy all the time and then something happens to- It comes and gets it, you. It's like it's like, like, the, like the principal's coming to get you and take yeah, like you what I you didn't, need. Like I started doing, I wasn't someone who wanted to do stand up. Just, I was someone who knew she would be famous. Yeah, but who, but who knew what you wanted to do when your feelings are all fucked up like they've been? That's true. But yeah. most people who wanted to do stand, like wanted we're thinking to do about it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And so I went and watched stand up. It's just not something I thought I could do. And then I told people at work that I did. Stand -up. Do you have other things you can just do all of a sudden? Yes. Like what? Uh, most things. I get good at things pretty. Quick. Give me an example. Um. I went to a hypnotist. Oh, and you start hypnotizing people? And then I went and yeah. got certified as a hypnotist yeah. and was like top of my class. Yeah. I was like, this is cool. I should get certified in this. Pretty much anything I put my mind to, I, I get good at pretty fast. Is, is that because of come. intellectual horsepower, do you think? Or that's because of... Well, I would tell you it's because my mercury is an Aquarius. But well, other, than <laughs> <laughs> other than that. Other than that. I mean, you always had good intellectual capacity. Yeah. Yeah. What's your ethnicity? I don't know. Yeah. 
Garcia is my last name, but You're there's some Irish bleach in there somewhere. <laughs> um, all right, let's. Let, I could talk to you all day. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that as a compliment. And I, I appreciate. Let me just pay sort of tribute to your willingness to be open and honest about this stuff, and actually connect about it, and be so open and present. You're pretty present right now, right? Yeah. Which is kind of hard for you. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for saying it. I like have a question, but I'm afraid that it'll make me cry. Um, uh, Look me in the eye when you ask it. No, that'll definitely make me cry. Sex is a is a landmine. Like Not sex, bad. is We're it ever that... gonna be okay? It's gonna be like, God, I have a bad ankle and I wanna be a basketball player. Like you could do it. You could yeah. be a great basketball player. Ankle's always gonna bug you. Yeah. But you can still do it. Um, for is a long that... time it needed to be rape. It needed to be yeah, it's, don't do that. bad role play. Yeah. And or so so what it's gonna be, it's either you have to be bad or he has to be bad, right? Yeah. You you, you gotta get integrated enough that you can be Into, you and he can be him and you can also be sexual. If I have sexual contact with someone outside of the three people that I've been in love with that I could have sex with, which uh wasn't the case with my husband. And that was my one relationship that didn't go down a toxic codependent nightmare. And mm. I now, in retrospect, I'm like, oh, so we didn't tap into that vulnerability intimacy thing. So I didn't damage that relationship. But if I like, I can't have casual sex. I'm currently right now, no dating, no sex for a year. Cause Good. I got a, a bunch of stuff to sort through. But Good. if I do have sex with someone, man or woman, I cannot, I just can't talk to them anymore after that. Yeah. My first few sexual experiences by few, I mean 15. So, so that's, <laughs> um, so that's shame. Yeah. Right. I had, uh, as a teenager, a lot of sex with adult men. Um, in my head, I remembered it as me seducing them. And recently with the arrival of this duffel bag of feelings, God, this is such a buzzkill, Jessa. Um, with this arrival of the duffel bag of feelings, I kind of perceive those memories as different where they're yeah. a little bit. Fuck those guys. Yeah, I was a victim. I have a real problem with when the rape culture stuff came out, I really fought against it. I was like, no, it's not rape if they right. fuck you while you're drunk. Right, right, right. Because I couldn't deal with the idea of having been a victim. Right. Because victim is, what's the word that comes after that? Being a victim is. For losers. Yeah, it's <laughs> right, right. It's shameful. It's shameful, right? Mm -hmm. It's shameful to be a victim. Ugh, I hate that word, but yeah, man, it is the it's the 2019 uh, word, yeah. shame and trauma. Yeah. So good and good, and here we are, and you're still standing. Yeah, I'm a I'm a comedian. Has that been obvious at all during <laughs> so, this? The stories were so uplifting. No, but um, again, I I could go on and on and on, and I, I appreciate you sharing it. But we're going to go on to some other stuff. And we're going to try to help other people. All right. You go with that? Yeah. Do, feel... Do I get to be here while you sell dick pills? Uh, I think it's already happened. Oh, okay. Damn it. Uh, but, but. Story of my life. But, but are you okay moving on? Yes. Do you feel yes, like. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Can we do it 10 minutes ago? No, because why? No, I'm just kidding. I, 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 got, I, I feel this, like I got real sad. Well, second. I have this feeling you're going to, you're going to diminish this experience, experience when you walk away. Yeah. You're no, gonna, I'm going to do the thing I always do, and I'm going to feel terrible about all the stuff I said on right. the podcast, and, and you're which gonna, is my podcast But you're going to blame me and you. You're going to blame us for this. No. Oh, I'm already blaming you. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. So, no, so, is, so, so, so we need to, we, you know, to, to make things okay, you have to sort of go, this is my life. This is, it's, mm -hmm. there's nothing to be ashamed of. You're going to help other people. We're going to get inundated with people who've been through experiences like this. We're going to call in and say, I'm so you made me feel okay by talking about it. I'm sure you get that all the time. Yeah, I do. You probably don't take that in though. No, I do. I yeah. do. Okay. I, so I, I, it's the thing that makes me keep doing it. Okay. So it's fine. All right. Hey, we have to take another quick break from the show so I can tell you about our sponsor, Proactive. I am delighted and excited to have these guys as part of our program. You've all known Proactive. They've been number one acne brand for over 25 years. And school's starting again. It's time for school to come back, but not acting to come back. So let's take care of this. Uh, I'm sure many of you are parents are aware that the consequences socially of having bad skin are really quite profound, especially these days with the, all the cameras and Instagram and all this. It's important. And now Proactive has a new product called Proactive MD. 
It includes a product called Adapalene, which is a prescription product I've been using for years, and it's now available over the counter in this Proactive MD product. I knew this would be a great product when I heard about it. My son using it, I'm using it, both having great results. I'm trying to get my whole family on it because we've all been cursed with the great uh, condition of adult acne, so not just adolescents get it. And the Proactive products have been just sensational. You, you'll be happy. Plus, they have a money-back guarantee I'll tell you about in just a minute. So, you know, the kids are getting back to school. Let's let this be mm, not an anxious time for them so they can have confidence their skin is clear. It's uh, a safe and effective system that will get everyone looking great for the new year. It's a deep cleansing face wash, daily oil control with SPF 30, and the Adapalene gel. The Adapalene is that great retinoid that really it's, it is for comedo control and opens the pores. Excellent product. And right now, for our listeners, we have a back-to-school offer from Proactive. You cannot get anywhere else with your Proactive MD order. And again, this new product is called Proactive MD. You're going to love it. You'll also receive a free Proactive on-the-go bag, which features their T-Zone, T-Zone oil absorber, body acne wash, green tea moisturizer, $100 value nearly. I'm using all this stuff. It is great. Plus free shipping. With This is the 60-day money-back guarantee. So if you're not happy... Money back guarantee. That's how that's how confident they are in this product, and, and well, they should be. So do do not wait. Go to proactive. That's p r o a c t i v dot com slash drew d r e w. Not Dr. Drew on this one. So it's proactive dot com slash drew to get our special offer again. Proactive dot com slash drew to make that order and get your kids' first day back at school. One of their best days ever. Proactive dot com slash d r e w. Now let's get back to the program. All right, so let's uh, do. We, I, I don't feel like we should watch videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you no, let's skip, the, videos. Let's let's skip that one. Do you want to watch no? some videos? Yeah. If she wants to watch them, okay. What, how bad are they? We need uh, a palate cleanser. These, these ones are good. These ones. Oh, actually, this one might be good. Okay, let Maybe me set we this show up Tom's really mom farting again to really just make everybody okay. All right, here we go. Okay, so a little setup on this guy uh is that this uh was recently on your mom's house and i want to know drew mm -hmm. if you think this is a multi-parter uh there's a couple you don't worry we could tap out of this whenever you want but All this right. is a segment that we do called master of accents of accent yeah so the question is uh is this an accent or i mean is there something wrong with this person like the is way he that brain he talks? injured or does he is have it, an accent is it a speech impediment or is he yeah. just irish i guess <laughs> is the question <laughs> okay here we go in Clarny because we've been invited by a very special character. I hear he's a local legend, and his name is Sham. Oh, Sham, look at that. No reason, Sham, look at that. Sham, how are you? Go on, my dear. We're here in Killarney today. Nice to meet you. Are you from Killarney? I'm, I'm, I'm on Booker. Why am I, I'm, why am I out of Born and bred. Born and bred in Killarney. Okay. Yep. That's a dental issue, isn't it? That is multiple things. <laughs> what that are the is, things? Uh, you listed off. Visual impairment. He's blind. Whoa, how could you tell that? You don't he's staring up I'm, at the I mean, he's staring sun. right. Hold on. Uh, he, let me scrub a little bit. No, yep. You're, yeah, he's not really. He, he's not looking at the guy. Yep, you're if right. he's not visually impaired, he has a wow. serious brain problem. Wow, problems. you really picked up on uh, that. He, he <laughs> is, has a horrible Irish accent. He has, <laughs> he has dental issues that's making him dysarthric. And I think there is an aging related brain phenomenon there. In addition to that blindness, there's something else going on. I'm not what do you think? Let's makes see if we can find Oh, he ends up looking at him. So oh, wow. oh, there we go. Okay, so Definitely that's, not blind. that's more. No, 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 no. That's still like macular degeneration because he's not really kind of able to kind of see things. Oh, is he just turning his head in the direction where the he sound is? He can kind of see things, but he probably sees in a tiny little dot. And so that's why he missed the guy walking in. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, man. All the doors with more of that. Not how to the door. Yeah, lots of tourists around. It's great, isn't it? Great, it's great. give me the job away. So my <laughs> question, like, yeah, how, how could anyone understand this? They can't. No. No, the guy that's interviewing him. The guy that's interviewing back the one word. Well, if you understood, that if, you had a, if you had an ear for the Irish brogue, you probably would be better able to, better equipped to handle this. Uh, I cannot. I no. cannot get it. I can't understand this. any accent. What's your favorite thing about Killarney? Timmy Carlin, my best thing. Chatting then. Timmy Carlin from Chatting then. He been my better than me, Connor. Yeah. Just again, good player. Got a little emphysema too. Did you hear some of that in, in, that breathing problem? And he's breathing, gasping in between. Wow. Some of those. Uh, so still, is he still alive? Do we know? 
<laughs> John uh, got I think, I think this was uh, this was recent. I think this had just recently gone viral. So I mean, he may be the oldest man in Killarney. I'm not yeah. exactly 100 percent sure. All right, next, what do you got next for? Tell me if you think this is a good idea or not. We're going to go with the Jarvi. Jarvi. Oh, I see. I what also you don't mean. understand. Yeah, you meant the next clip. Next clip. I'm done right. with. with uh, uh, why don't you do another? Uh, why don't you do an email while I set up the next? All one? right, I will do that. Um, these are sort of long ones. Uh, big fan, 34 year old male. Ever since I was in mid to late teens, I've been waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I would understand if I were drinking a lot, blah, 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 use the bathroom before bed, but somewhere between 1.30 and 4.30 without fail, I'm waking up. Usually have a cup of coffee in the morning, water the rest of the day, I used to drink a lot of soda. Tried over the counter sleep aids, but still wake up. My dad seems to be the same way. Is it something that runs in the family? Any thoughts? Um, you should see a urologist. It could be prostatitis. It could be uh, people. some people have small bladder, con bladder you know, uh, contents. They can't hold a lot of volume. And I would definitely not drink anything after about 6 p.m. And again, there can be other things that, that affect this in the middle of the night. You really have to see how your bladder works formally to be able to say anything about that. Here's divorce as an adult child. I'm 33, just told my parents are separating after four years of marriage. This is interesting. I'm having trouble trying to understand the range of emotions I'm having in reaction, anger to sadness, even though I'm glad it didn't happen at, at 13. I'm still struggling. Any advice for adults dealing, dealing with this? As always, piss on me, beat me, love your show. This is code yeah. here. <laughs> um, so I you thought think? you were against that. <laughs> and so what do you think about that? So it's, it's kind of interesting, is it? There's a lot more of that these days because people are living so long, you know? Yeah, well, I think we're also like collectively getting away from this idea that you have to stay together forever, forever out of obligation or out of survival. Is there like ages that are ideal to... Well, the real question is, well, you, not when somebody's developing, obviously, it can affect right. their development. But, but... At an older age, you wonder if this is a 33-year-old, could it affect his relationship or her relationships? Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, especially because if your parents stayed together and you're, what, a millennial, then you feel like, you know, you were probably in the minority and... Um, and then it, it, it helps you, it erodes your faith in the, in the, exactly. the, the fact of marriage. And, and you're having a mourning and your reaction to it and you're feeling lost. And so you're attacking the institution of marriage in response to that, as opposed to sort of standing back and going, oh, they had 40 good years, the marriage worked, uh, whatever happening now is happening now, and you know maybe be a little more magnanimous about it. All right, let's see that video. All right, so a little bit of a setup for this. So uh, this is an angry dad, uh, or maybe not even a dad, but he drove by a school uh, and he saw an advertisement for a vape company. Okay. And so keep in mind, this is happening during summer. This is information that I found out after we aired this, but um, he is very upset that there's advertisement uh, of a vape company okay. in front of a school I in the wait. middle of summer. I can't wait to see this. So you tell me if this seems like uh, like anger placed in the right place, Drew. Right, Traumatic reenactment. Yes. All right, so I'm out in front of uh, the uh, high school. And here we are with effervescence right in front of the high school supporting vapes for all of our young kids that are below 18. So, so far he seems pretty reasonable, right? Yeah. All right, it gets worse. And by the way, there's weird moral outrage around vaping, like weird moral panic. Yeah. People are in a panic about it. Do you feel like it's the same as smoking? No, no. Not, not even close. Are you pro vaping? I'm not pro adolescent vaping, but I'm pro vaping generally. Okay. And But cool. people are just in panic about it. Yeah. And it's not tobacco. Tobacco is what causes the cancer and heart disease, not nicotine. When I when I treated, imagine you had cigarettes at your all mm -hmm. your meth days. If you needed to be detoxed from tobacco, I would put you on gum and keep you on it. You know what I mean? I would yeah. let you take the nicotine every day. Nice. Yeah. If 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 you had trouble stopping, if you started in your teen years, the probability of you being to be off nicotine very low. Yeah. So you just stay I smoked on for it. like ten years. Same thing. Just got bored and quit. Good. That's interesting. The bored and quit thing. It's strange, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird quirk. Mercury and Aquarius. Yeah, that's it. Must be that. Or yeah. Or the aliens. Here we go. Let's hear the let's hear the angry dad. Yep, here he comes. What? I'm sorry? What's wrong? Open your fucking eyes and read, Josh. Are you retarded? Epervescence <laughs> vapes in front of a high school? Dude, what is the do you know how to read? Keep so, going. I want to hear where he goes with this. Right. I like the Petunia Festival <laughs> on his shirt. The Dixon Petunia Festival. Yeah, so that's Josh who works for the Dixon Petunia Festival. So he's the one that put up the sign. Of I course. Think. 
Do you know how to read? I do. Then fucking tell me what's wrong with vapes in front of the high school and kids are getting caught with them and we don't know what it does. Well, what's wrong? I'm putting up a sign. I'm a functioning there. illiterate. Are you telling me you can't see how stupid you are? Is effervescence probably just some plant food that they use at the Petunia Festival? <laughs> Well, I'm gonna have police come now. You go ahead, I've already called them! Alright, good. So, you know, whoever calls first is the one that's not in trouble. I understand that. What's your let me Wait, what? That's quite that's quite a bit of backpedaling, huh? That's logic. Oh, yeah. we already has an energy drink. In I know, it's hysterical. He's <laughs> Please see your ID. Would you rather have me? I would rather see your ID, Josh. Excuse me, sir. Is there something I can help you with? No, shirt. you can walk away and stop but making yourself a part of this. Um, go away. away. Yeah. So uh, this guy, uh, who I think either works for the school or yeah. the Petunia Festival, yeah. noticed all the yelling uh -huh. and came over and was trying to help the ruckus. And this is how this guy responds. This is getting to good. Him. So this is how you want to handle things? You goddamn Maybe right. You when people don't read signs, they gotta get shook the fuck up. Whoa, whoa, sir. You've never made a mistake in your life. Fucking every day of my life. I mean, <laughs> so then, then why don't you resolve this? Like because that? they look at me like I'm retarded. No, they're not looking. It's all right. At you. I got all your names. You're on YouTube Live right now. It's all good. So there's a lot of insecurity I, going. I love on. the yeah. track and field guy. He's my favorite guy so far. Yeah, he seems pretty reasonable. He's, he's like he's my favorite. Out of yeah, yeah, too. yeah, yeah. Uh, but this guy just keeps on getting crazy. This is not your property. She said go ahead and get it down. She said not no your such property. Thing. I have it on recording, Elliot, so get back in your little Sir, wheelchair and go away. This is down. not your property. Oh, he's now on the school property. He's jumped the fence. I think, I think what happened shark. was that some of these ladies that walked by, they're like, look, if you want to take the sign down, you could take down the sign. But then the people that work for Petunia are like, uh, no, 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 you no. can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You need to get back in the I was told that I could cut it down. And I'm a board member. I'm saying you can't. Don't give a shit. Why don't you read some shit? Yeah, I don't agree with that either. <laughs> then why are you allowing it? Because they give us money. for Because you're a festival. fucking fat ass whore. Ooh. Woo. So pretty cool guy, right? Does this keep going? Uh, this this is nearing the end. I think the this is next, the great stuff. But I think the, the, the next clip we have. This is big nicotine lobbyists. I, I know. They are. But this is what meth can do for you, too. You can get like this. You need to get back. Right? Well, it's a monster energy drink. Oh, it's the energy drink. Okay. Could be. Sorry, that was actually the last clip. Oh. I feel like tweakers are pretty p pro vape. Pro vape, yeah, it's true. The You're smoke right. is very similar. It's a weird trigger thing oh, when people vape around me. It doesn't like make me want to use, but the clouds are the same as meth smoke. Oh, it interesting. Gives me like a weird feeling. Oh, why? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Are there are there Maybe stuff? That's this guy's trip. Maybe that's interesting. Is there is there stuff that threatens your sobriety presently? No, I do do psychedelics. Does that? <laughs> My podcast is called Soberish. Um, and this, which ones do you do? What psychedelics? Acid, mushrooms. Are you doing a lot of that DMT, stuff? DMT. A couple times a year, a few times a year. I, I just worry. On and off since 2012. I, I Have you tried ketamine? I did a lot in the early aughts. I, how, about, how about getting it like prescribed? I would love to do that, yeah. You, you might want to do this that. This is why I do psychedelics. I believe that they have. I took seven years of complete abstinence before I came to, and then I dipped my toe in and then I took years off again. I don't like alcohol. I don't. Is it, pot. is it causing any elevated sustained elevation of mood or anything or? No, I do believe it has like psychological and spiritual benefits. For yeah. Yeah. Those of us that. Well, there, there's aliens. a whole world of this that needs to be explored, right? Yeah. I do I, think that you're, it, you're not like, the perfect choice for that. Yeah. I'm just, I'm yeah. just saying, I figured but, you would but, say that, but. but, but still, I mean, I can't tell you categorically it's bad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We just don't know yet. And we don't know what doses, we don't know what frequency, we don't know, but we do know with ketamine. And so that's something you can look into. Yeah. I had yeah. a lot of. And I, by the way, K holes back in the and, day. and by the way, I have addicts that use ketamine successfully. Yeah. Without being triggered or anything, so yeah. it worries me. But there's there's good data there at least. Yeah, I think it's um, I think alcohol's the worst in terms of triggering. Just in general, I think it's a garbage substance. I hate that it's socially acceptable. I hate that it's mm -hmm. legal. I hope I hate that it's used in moderation by I don't hate is a strong word. I don't really care. But it just love all of the substances, like how acid people It's weird it's weird. It's bizarre that we ascribe certain status and moral yeah. pos position to molecules. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's either encumbered with a history that we don't see, back to your aliens, you know, teaching you that we you know stuff hidden from our consciousness right 
uh, or it's encumbered with a moral outrage that has no basis in reality. Yeah. Uh, or it's it's glorified without the scientific data to glorify it. So it's just yeah. all messed up. It's like a weird ego juice. Talking and, about alcohol now. Yeah. I just think how strange the collective consciousness must must have been back in like the Mad Men days where everyone was just drunk all day. Isn't that weird? You know, and then isn't that what people are calling Make America Great Again? Is that the era that they're talking about when it was great? I can't figure out what era it was, but like, is that what they're talking about I when everyone was just living in a fake repressed reality? It's an interesting point. I, yeah. I, I, I Drunk at work. Yeah. It's insane. I, 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 no, I don't remember. I think people would say that it's, well, who knows? I, I don't know how to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantasy, right? That America was this like idea that it was at some point other than here. or There was economic the dominance. And I think that's what they're pointing at. Okay. I think yeah. that's what they want. They want to feel that again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of great lives and great social functioning, I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. We got, uh, here's one. My name is RJ. I'm 21 from uh, Tampa. Uh, my fiance saved me from a terrible addiction, meth, opiates, benzos. Uh, before my use began, I always suffered terrible mood swings. I finally became sober. Noticed the mood swings have worsened. As you, were, how did you describe when you came off meth? Social anxiety. No, you went whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you feel all kinds of things when you're coming down. Uh, sometimes I can become manic, and other times I just happy and calm. That's not good. Suffer from seeing things that aren't there, even voices in my head. Okay, we need to get this treated, right? Uh, but other times it can make me depressed. I almost feel that it might be a healthy cope. No, no, no. Uh, so RJ, uh, get an evaluation. Uh, there's something going on here. It could be left over from the meth and it could be something that will settle down. It could be related to opiate withdrawal, even benzodiazepine withdrawal. That can last for up to a year after you stop. But if you're seeing things, hearing things, you want to have that evaluated. Uh, and if you're having manic episodes, again, that could be a withdrawal phenomenon, but it could be something that, you know, in general, when people are, are having bipolar symptoms, even if it's clearly related to drug withdrawal, I will put people on mood stabilizing meds because they just feel they're just so much better. Yeah, they're better and able to get through that whole period. Uh, any other? We haven't done voicemails yet. Yeah, we got a couple voicemails. Okay, let's do it. Hey, Dr. Drew, this is Daryl Monk out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Long story short, I've been a marijuana user for over 27 years straight since I was about nine years old. Um, no exaggeration. Would never every <laughs> single day, every single waking moment for the last 27 years. Good times. I have not been sober, always under the influence. It's gotten to the point now where I can't remember the last time marijuana has actually got me stoned or high. Right. And now I, and every time I try to quit, I have a severe stomach cramps sure. and pain. Sure. And I hate marijuana now. Mm. I, I don't want it to be a part of my life, but I can't get rid of it. Otherwise, I'm deathly sick. Uh, I was wondering if there's any medications that are able to be prescribed yeah. for so, the symptoms of... So this is the way it goes. Eventually it stops working. They stop getting high. They start getting irritable and depressed. And they start smoking a lot more to try to get it back. And then they kind of slides further. Uh, and then when they stop, they have withdrawal. Uh, there are lots of treatments for the withdrawal. I, I used to treat it all the time. Sick? People get sick from it? They get a, almost an opiate withdrawal, some of them. Really? Some of them. I mean, really heavy smokers like this. And the big thing they get, they get, they get, they get paranoid and they get sleeplessness. Their sleep's fucked up for six months. And the paranoias are, can be very intense sometimes. And they can get abdominal pain and they can feel horrible and you know achy and the whole thing like an opiate withdrawal almost. What are your thoughts on... But there is lots of treatment. Get somebody who knows what they're doing to treat you and go to MA. Marwan, you'll hear a bunch of guys, a bunch of men and women with exactly your story. Do you think that it is like now that it's legal and people are using it more, do you think... Like what are your thoughts on weed becoming legal? Do you think it's a good I, recreational... I, I, I always was... Um, agnostic about the laws. I feel like the laws are something people create. And then I, as a physician, deal with whatever the legal situation people want to make is. As I told you, I think it's bizarre that some things are legal and some things are illegal and some things are immoral. It's fucking ridiculous. It's just molecules and humans have a relationship with these molecules and they cause certain, they have a certain natural history with the human and that's it. Um, so cannabis is now legal. We're seeing some more medical stuff. We're seeing like, you know, intractable vomiting and dogs are getting into it and having seizures and having all kinds of stuff. You know, it, you can still point at alcohol and go, it's worse. So I don't, I'm still kind of agnostic. Though I'm having a problem with my position because I've been really getting involved with the homeless thing lately. And a lot of the problem on the streets is the lack of enforcement of any drug laws. And so people are just using drugs on the streets and they're going to die. And so I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable. I used to go, I don't care if it's illegal. Opiates or? Op meth and opiates primarily. Okay. 
and as you know, the meth is just gonna, they're going to deteriorate and they're going to die by other means. Opiates, they're going to die because they stop breathing. Uh, and I, I, it's making me feel like leaving drugs illegal is leaving people, li, uh, not enforcing drug laws is leaving people to die. And it, it's troubling me. So I, so I'm, I, I'm, I thought I was going to be more like, I don't care, legal, illegal, let's just deal with the drug addiction and let the laws stand for themselves. Not having the tool of motivating addicts into treatment is causing people to die. And it's, I'm uncomfortable with that. Interesting. Yeah. I, I'm not someone that feels like criminalizing addiction helps in any way, yeah. shape, or form. I just know so many people, we all kind of started using at the same time. I'm one of the few people that didn't end up in jail in the system. And I just watched so many people that were just addicts on drugs get picked up on possession, and then they come out with this whole criminal skill set you could just send yeah them yeah into, yeah i know into I, an I, apprenticeship of I, I, criminal activity they should be in mental health facilities right right so right. so i firmly believe that but you have to find ways to motivate people into that right yeah and that's the problem that's what i'm having trouble with because if you don't the opiate addicts particularly if you don't motivate them into treatment i mean as the big book will tell you they you go to institutionalization prison or death yeah if you take away institutionalization and prison you're left with death yeah that's the part i'm struggling with right now yeah so well, listen, uh, as I said, I could talk to you all day. We'll have to have a part two <laughs> with Bert. And maybe we should do that. And uh, do you have anything to say before we uh, wrap up here? Where can people find you? Where do you want people to go? Sorry, I got really sad there in the middle. It was never sad. Okay. It, it, no. No. It's just really interesting. Okay. Interestingly sad. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's my brand. So if you're into that or you're into weird alien stuff, I do have an addiction podcast that was an addiction podcast for four episodes. And then I turned it into a Jessa Talks to Aliens podcast. Soberish. So, soberish. Yeah. And then I also have another podcast called Mormon and the Meth Head. Oh, I saw that one. Yeah. What, what's that about? You would love him. Uh, that is myself and a Mormon met at a, a comedy festival. And he had just left Mormonism. And we saw all these weird parallels between re-entering society after quitting drugs and him entering society. This is a person who... Uh, didn't drink his first drink of alcohol till he was 30, didn't get his first blow job until he was 30. It's like, a, it's, it's a very interesting, so many things in common that you wouldn't believe. That makes sense to me. People would have in common. Yeah. Like and, you may get a cult survivor in there. I'm not saying that yeah. Mormonism is a cult. No, but it's, it, a, yeah. it's another kind of reentry kind of phenomenon. And so, and two not super celebrated groups of people in society, you know, not super protected by, you know, there's not a lot of people. Mormon and are, meth heads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then it just kind of turned into a lot of things. It's mostly just a, a childhood trauma. We made it to like episode five before it was called, uh, we got molested. <laughs> oh, he <laughs> got molested story, too? Mm -hmm. from, not from related to the church stuff. No. And so, um, yeah, so the Mormon and the meth head and then also soberish and then so just a Mor Mor Mormon and the meth head subtitle. We got molested. Start at the beginning of Mormon and the meth head. Cause it's a whole journey. Okay. Soberish is only, and did you put them, do you put them up on a regular basis or mm -hmm. every week, uh, Monday, soberish Mormon and the meth head Tuesday. It's a real pleasure. Yeah. This is great. And uh, we've got to have you back do more. Cause there's okay. more, oh, yeah, I have way the, more, more sad stories. That's <laughs> <laughs> sad. All right, and uh, thank you to Jessa, and thank you to you all. We'll see you next time. All conversations and information exchanged during participation of the Dr. Drew After Dark podcast or interaction on the drdrew.com website is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. Do not confuse this with treatment or physician medical advice or direction per se. You must always follow your medical professional's advice and direction. Nothing on these podcasts or posted on this site supplements or supersedes the relationship and direction of your medical caretakers. Please understand, I am not playing the role of physician in this environment per se. I'm educating. I am a licensed physician with specialty boards in American Board of Internal Medicine and American Board of Addiction Medicine.